so what I'm talking about today is uh, an initiative in Toronto called Tower Renewal or Tower Neighborhood Renewal. It's looking at the buildings that you, you see in this slide. And we know these buildings are really heavy in the, uh, they, they weigh heavily in terms of discourse of modern urbanism from, from geography to planning to, to architecture. And I know that when I was a student of architecture, they'd show a slide of a building like this and say, these buildings are terrible, and then everyone knows they're really sad, and we should get them all out. And I always sort of felt that was a bit of a strange statement um, and a bit of sort of a, uh, a one-off. And there's been a period probably from the 70s to the 90s in which that was this, uh, sort of like high postmodernism. There, there really was an agenda against this type of building to the point where it became so accepted that people really were questioning it. And so the work that we've done, and I've sort of been doing since grad school, has been sort of looking at these more objectively and just saying, what are their ur urban opportunities? What are they just sort of as artifacts and as communities rather than as uh, ideologies and as these sort of like, you know, heavy things? Um, so let me try them out. There we go. Oh, it's very sensitive. Okay, so, so Tower Renewal, uh, sort of writ large, and I'll get into this in much more detail, is this idea of looking at these as a catalyst for uh, growth and, and urban regeneration in a lot of, a lot of the neighborhoods that I'll go over. And it's something that we've been working on for about eight years. Um, there's a lot of it has been about changing attitudes and a lot of on the ground community work. So there's a definite uh, bottom up component to this. Most of it is for the bottom up process, but also a top down in terms of setting policies, setting agendas, changing attitudes, and, and a lot of research. Um, but so, probably a little context about uh, the, the firm I work for, or the firm I work for, is how we engage in this type of practice. Because uh, here in Texas, located in Toronto, and we're a private practice. So we, uh, I'm not familiar, affiliated directly with the university. I do a lot of work with the University of Toronto, and a lot of uh, area universities. But a lot of the work that we've done, and I've done on this file, has been well working for private sort of outside of my desk and sort of our pro bono, um, uh, doing our pro bono. And it's been really interesting about how you can leverage uh, when you're working in practice some of these things that um, are just difficult for a lot of firms to engage in when they're just sort of, you know, working day to day to day with bills. Um, so this is where Toronto is, in case you're in geography of Canada and not snuffed. That, that's, that's where we're located, very close to here. This is where Toronto looks like today. And um, this is sort of a typical neighborhood, this, the streetscapes in Toronto, it's sort of these downtown Victorian um, neighborhoods. And why I'm showing this is that this is where a lot of the psychology and the identity of Toronto has come from in the last 30 years. Uh, the Lady and Jacobs lived in Toronto uh, from the 70s onward. A lot of our identity was about reclaiming these uh, older Detroit neighborhoods. Um, and so this, there's almost like an anti-modern uh, bent to a lot of the intelligentsia and a lot of the planning ideas that sort of been in Toronto for the last, um, since the 70s. <coughs> and our firm is sort of, uh, in a weird way, very much part of that. We're focused a lot on Toronto's history. We're, uh, and, and the simplest way to describe us is we're heritage architects. We work on destroying older buildings. We work on helping uh, develop master plans that look at how you can work with the character of existing neighborhoods and allow growth. Um, this is sort of the Victorian uh, map of Toronto. Some of the, the work that, that uh, We've worked on and I've worked on is taking older abandoned Victorian neighbor or warehouses and turning them into mixed use neighborhoods. Uh, this is a project you might have heard of, it's called the Evergreen Brickworks, and it's an old abandoned brick factory in the middle of a valley. And it's turned into this sort of like eco education center, and it's you know where you go buy your overpriced organic fruit and that type of thing. Um, and so these are the types of projects that have been sort of defining Toronto for the last uh, 15 years or so, uh, and what a lot of our practice is based on. These are some of the urban uh, plans that we've been looking at this at the University of Toronto and a lot of the work is looking at cultural heritage landscapes and working with um, how do you grow well maintaining what has value. So sort of within that context of looking at these more traditional frames of what people conceive to be heritage that we've kind of expanded a little bit and have, have dived into these different topics. And this is a nonprofit we started called the Center for Urban Growth and Renewal. We did this with a few other firms and it was a way to target our, our pro bono work and actually to focus it and to do it in partnership with um, universities and other agencies and say, how can we take uh, some of the things that we'd like to be doing and scale it up a little bit. Um, and so some of the work has been uh, exhibitions. This is a density analysis of the city of Toronto for the larger city. So for context, downtown is right here and all those Victorian neighborhoods I described are kind of this, but then the, the larger city, the metropolitan area, are, are much larger and have a lot of different characteristics. And this is about how to expand that conversation and expand the tent about what, uh, what planning could be. Um, We've also written books and sort of expanding the idea of what heritage is and what types of buildings have value. This is a book called Concrete Toronto, where we look at uh, brutalism and, and uh, 
mid-century architecture, it really said that the way we sort of framed it is that you can't solve an urban problem unless you love the subject. And so too many practitioners come in and say, this neighborhood has problems, I'm going to fix it. And as opposed to saying, well, what are the real values? What are the real, what was the original idea that this could happen in the first place? What, what is, what's so great about these, you know, uh, mid-century concrete tower blocks and where did that come from? That's a little bit what this talk is going to be about. And this book sort of actually was a lot more successful than we thought. Suddenly, um, um, people that went to uh, concrete shopping malls or concrete bus stops or the concrete uh, middle schools, they said, yeah, I love this book. That's where I went. This is part of my story. So it was sort of a, uh, expanding the kind of narrative of what, uh, what does have value. Uh, and then a lot of this is this sort of new movement of modern heritage. And so this is from City Hall under construction in the mid 1960s. It's a pretty spectacular building. And now it's considered, after kind of a big fight, um, one of the city's most valued heritage buildings. And so this was a real push to say that heritage is in you know, Victoria, and heritage is now reduced to sort of more contemporary structures. And so on that, some of our work is actually going through and, and uh, listing and designated uh, rural buildings. This is one that was just done recently that we're happy about. Another part of our work, this is a large museum Road project in Toronto. Uh, having the pleasure of help uh, choose the, the tone of black paint for its refurbishment. So, uh, you know, it actually turns into to practic practical work when you sort of set the, the cultural agenda to say what does have value. Um, but most importantly, why I'm here today is to talk about the sort of modern suburbs and sort of the modern era of planning. Um, something that I'm very interested sort of across North America, very much in Europe and, and particularly in Toronto. And so, this is a, a plan for Toronto in 1943. And in here was the germs of a lot of ideas that shaped the way the metropolitan era, era grew. And it had nothing to do with the sort of Victorian era, the um, pre-war fabric down there. In fact, it was you know, kind of hell bent on destroying it. Um, and so because of that, there, there's a real, there's been this cultural amnesia about addressing this era of planning and saying that that's not because of the sort of scarred histories of blockbusting and all these other types of things that we're all familiar with. Um, so part of what we're looking at is how do we give this era value and how do we then re-engage it because only be engaged, um, these parts of the cities are only going to be more and more engaged as we continue to grow and rethink. So the concrete tower block, so this is sort of the, the, the focus of research that I've been doing for the last several years, which has sort of then turned into this sort of urban initiative uh, in Toronto. Uh, so these are the buildings. Uh, Toronto's actually, I've, I've discovered, I mean, having been from this place, you sort of get used to these things, but through the international research has realized that we're a bit bizarre that we have a lot of these buildings. In fact, we have more of these buildings than any other city in North America. Um, and most of them are sort of suburbanized. So they're not located downtown or they're comparable to the south loop. They're very, very far away from, from the city center. Uh, this is an image um, of, of downtown, of, of Toronto. This is sort of flying into the little downtown airport that we were just chatting about. Uh, and what's interesting here isn't the downtown. I mean, there's much more impressive downtowns, uh, including Chicago's, which is significantly more impressive. What's interesting here is the high rises that you see in the background, these sort of 20 story slab buildings that really go as far as the eye can see in every direction. Um, this is what some of those landscapes look like, so very different than sort of the postcard image of the Victorian neighborhoods. This is what large swaths of the city is home to millions of people, and this is the, the sorts of landscapes that they, that they live in. Uh, and looking at sort of the history of, of high-rise housing, part of this has been a little bit of myth-busting about the shape of the suburbs and the form of the suburbs. Uh, this is looking at housing starts from 1960 to 2010. So the blue is single-family homes, and the red is multiple. And the big sort of shocker for the research we've done is that the, during the big suburban boom between 1960 and 1980, way more apartment units were built than single family homes. In fact, in the 1970s, it's the complete inverse. I mean, hardly any single family homes were built. Then, sort of after the kind of uh, you know, the end of modernism and the sort of new ways of thinking and new urbanism takes over, and we have these sort of outer suburbs and they grew, and we have lots and lots of single family homes there. And then, in the sort of mid 2000s, uh, the sort of condo boom took over, and the trend is repeated itself. So now we're building an enormous number of high-rise condominiums and a very small number of single-family homes. In fact, the new policies, green-built policies for the region is nearly impossible to build single-family homes anymore. Um, and so the focus here is really looking at what we're calling boom one. So there's these two peaks of mass housing booms in the city. What happens to this boom as it ages? Now that the midpoint of this is a project that's 50 years old. So how does this housing that was built mostly all at the same time with the same set of architects and the same set of planning ideas, uh, how do we deal with an aging uh, population of um, so we've actually, this initial research led to sort of a whole cascading set of um, uh, research projects. This is for the province of Ontario. And we were uh, uh, tasked with, or advocated for really cataloging and understanding this. Because we can't, you can't understand the issue unless you don't you know, really know what the data is. And so we, we counted, uh, fairly neurotic, a series of grad students, and found that there are, there are in fact 2,000 of these buildings throughout the region. 
so it's sort of a, an astounding number, um, which are uh, 1,200 in the city of Toronto itself, which are conservatively one to a million people. So this is sort of, you know, like a national housing issue. It's not just sort of an esoteric sort of Toronto um, situation. This is how they're sort of distributed throughout the region. So this is the city of Toronto. This is sort of the um, uh, greater Toronto area. This is sort of the outlying area around that. And this is about eight, eight to nine million people in total. And sort of within this area, the bulk of the of the tower, 1,700, are located in this sort of core metropolitan area. Um, and this is how the distribution looks like in the city of Toronto. So this is some mapping that I've done <coughs> well as a grad student. So the white dots are where these towers are located. And this is downtown Toronto. And so what's interesting about this is this shows a very different picture than the typical organization of an North American city. We have high density in the middle and then increasingly low density as you go up. Or in fact, 80% of all rental housing is outside of downtown in the city of Toronto. And some of these neighborhoods way up here, about 20 kilometers north, are uh, higher residential densities than some of the larger downtown neighborhoods. So it's a very sort of different organization, metropolitan organization, than this typical North America. And I think part of the reason that this is noteworthy, but that we, we focus on this, is that most of the planning documents and the planning ideologies that were sort of uh, shaping the city weren't addressing this or were this. They weren't really shaping this as a starting point. Um, they just sort of considered these as buildings or neighborhoods that happened to have already existed in or from it. And so then uh, I dug this up in the archives uh, about, probably about 10 years ago. And this is what sort of really got it going in kind of a, you know, an optimistic way. So this is both Mr. Fuller, um, uh, who you all know is the famous inventor architect um, from Boston. He did a very famous geodesic dome in Montreal during Expo 67, so he was spending some time in Canada. And so he visited Toronto in 1968, and he says, in Toronto, an unusually large number of high-rise apartments poke above a flat landscape many miles from downtown. This is a type of high-density suburban development, far more progressive and able to deal with the future than that most problem in the U.S. So this is really interesting. So one, he's saying that it's unique, and two, he's saying it's, it's a good thing. And so what we did is sort of, you know, drop the ball and for spending about 40 years ignoring this housing debt and, and sort of rejecting it as a, as a failed modern experiment. And so part of, part of this exercise has been how do we begin to understand the original period in which these were built and the planning ideas around them in order to be able to embrace this to say, how indeed can the statement become true in the current context? So this is sort of the, the, the bones of this project, which is to say that there's, let's view these buildings as an asset. They're an asset that we have uh, very uh, dynamic and um, uh, very dynamic in various um, large communities. Uh, the buildings themselves, all the evidence is showing that the concrete of the buildings is relatively sound, could last for several more life cycles. It's sort of things like you know, windows and elevators and boiler systems that um, need to be replaced, but the structures themselves are actually um, very sound and they have huge land assets, assets associated with them um, in, in many parts of the city because the tower the park model was, was formed. So if this is sort of the starting point, how do we then sort of sprinkle all of the um, the, the contemporary ways of thinking of urbanism, especially over the last 15 years, um, the, the new ways we think about cities, how, as, if this is a starting point, what, how do we move forward? So this is sort of the, the germ of the idea that was set up um, uh, when this project started. But this is just giving a bit of background. So this is some of the, the history of where these things came from. This is A lot of this is from my research, and uh, I find this to be a lot of fun. Um, so this is, and I'm assuming because you're all urban geographers and planners and architects, and you know, find this interesting as well. Um, so this is uh, 1954, Toronto 1954. It was kind of a big year for Toronto. Uh, two major things happened. We finally got our first leg of our subway. So this is the, um, the subway open. There was about 12 stops at that point. But more importantly, the Metropolitan Toronto was formed. And so Metropolitan Toronto was an area that sort of uh, was built around 12 municipalities. Um, and if you look at the extent of it, most of its catchment area was, was to be developed. It was farmers. And so it set up sort of centralized planning authority to look at this metropolitan area, sort of one um, government. Um, and I've sort of been told that this type of thing was, was attempted in many American cities, but because of the way that government works, it was, it was, it was um, frustrated by, the, you know, if you look at Philadelphia, there's like seven municipalities that are in uh, Philadelphia. The way it works in Canada is that the provincial governments have much more authority than state governments, so they just sort of did this. And I think that there was, there may not have even been, um, uh, that there might have been people in the midst the municipalities themselves who weren't in favor of it, but this is sort of what's happened by decree. Um, but it's um, what I'm going to show you is sort of positive that comes of that. Another piece is this neighborhood called Don Mills, and I'll get into this a little bit. It was, um, as far as we can tell, it was North America's first sort of corporately planned, master planned modern neighborhood. It sort of followed the um, 
sort of all the principles of sort of modern planning. And it was designed by uh, what at the time was students at, um, uh, at, the, at the GSD. And supposedly Walter Grofi said, like, this will never happen, I'll never be able to build this. And he said, yes, I will. And he went to Toronto and built this thing because his dad owned the, the real estate corporation or something like that. Um, but what was interesting about it is that already in 1954, all the planning documents were talking about how there's uncontrolled sprawl and these types of neighborhoods you know, were built with just tract housing without any, um, you know, without any thought of mixed use and, and it's, it's a big disaster. So part of the idea of forming the Metropolitan Toronto was to establish a green line. So the idea that this northern boundary would be the end of the city and you, you build the town. And there was a mandate to say, how do we create more mixed use um, uh, suburban communities that we can call them complete communities that have places to work, that have a shop, and are contained. And so this neighborhood was sort of the, uh, a private sector um, person who said, we're going to actually do what you're describing and, um, and make it profitable. So these are the types of homes that we usually associate with this era. And well, there's lots and lots of these all over the Toronto area. Um, and this is a little bit what they were criticizing and saying, if we just do <coughs> this stuff, we're not going to have, we're going to have a problem with sprawl moving forward. And so um, some of the, the ideologies or the, the ideas that came, this is this uh, 43 plan again, we're saying we should sprinkle a whole series of satellite cities that are about 30 to 40,000 people in this, in this urban area. Um, and this is a, a guy named Faludi. He was trained in Rome. He came after the war in Toronto, had a big impact on the planning regime. And his, this is his diagram for how the suburbs should be built. We have these high density quadrants with sort of low density around them. And this is very much sort of how things eventually turned out. Um, so this is this neighborhood, Don Mills. It was very much built as sort of a satellite city. Um, part of the mandate of it is that everything had to be architect designed and, and, and modern. Uh, it's based on a sort of ring road. There's a central ring road, there's these cross streets, there's a large shopping center, there's sort of high density housing in the center, and there's these sort of uh, neighborhood units sort of spilling around. This is sort of what the neighborhood unit sections look like. Uh, and then this is some of the you know, high design modern housing. And it became really chic and cool. It suddenly was like the place that people wanted to live in, sort of like a, a mad net aesthetic. You can see this as people walking around and showing that, you know, the, the new, ut new utopia north of the city. Also, the sort of the schools and the factories and the postal stations were all architect design and sort of like, at that time, it was sort of the, the most progressive and, and modern neighborhood in the city. And this is sort of what that central plan looked like. And so, this is the shopping <coughs> center, um, and this is the, the, the apartment housing sort of in the center, and then the single bed homes. And so, what it did is it established the, um, the first time the idea that you could actually have multiple higher density housing in the center. So, it, and this is sort of that central. Um, but then what that had ushered in is it was a logical next step to say, can we make that, that uh, apartment housing higher density? And so it set up the model to say, this is, this is a way we think of neighborhoods. And then slowly what began to happen is that the apartments in the middle became bigger and bigger and bigger and became part of uh, how these suburban neighborhoods were. So this is a neighborhood that followed called Garfield Park, and this is one of the advertisements for it. Um, and then what's kind of amazing is that very quickly a landscape emerged that was almost like uh, high rises to farmers' fields. And so this is an image from the Manual of English Housing from 1946, where they're advocating this type of thing, you know, reconstruction after the war. And then this is sort of what happened in Toronto very soon afterwards. And there's a real link between a lot of English planners came in and spent time in the stint uh, in Toronto and a lot of them stayed. And so there was, there was a real sort of influence between what was happening and what, what became what was built in Toronto. And there's a real chronology between this is a neighborhood it's a, uh, in Sweden called uh, Valley. It's a, it's a suburb of Stockholm. And so all the journals around this time in the mid 50s were saying that this was the neighborhood that was the best way to build a suburb. And the, the, the components of it is that there's a, a new train line, there's a central sort of public space, there's high density surrounding it, and low density, and then green. So uh, this is what it looks like. You can visit it today, it's pretty much the same. It's actually a pretty fantastic place still. Um, and then this was in 1956, Roehampton in London was built on the outskirts, which followed some of these models, but it was a little bit more landscape-based, a little bit further spread up our towers. And then this is a neighborhood in 1958 called Fleming Park, which sort of follows this chronology and was sort of the Toronto response to this. So right after Don Mills was built, this was built sort of um, following this, this trajectory of neighborhoods. And one of the architects who worked on this was a Toronto-trained architect who was working in London, moved back, and became the master planner for this neighborhood. So there's sort of this real connection between what was happening in the outskirts of London and in Toronto. So this is what it looks like after it's all built. So you see the downtown is emerging, we have this new uh, freeway which was built, uh, and these are these sort of high density satellite communities that emerged really quickly. Um, this is the three we are looking at, or this is Doug Mills, this is um, Fleming, or uh, Thorncliffe Park, which showed the advertisement for, and this is another neighborhood called Fleming Park, which is the one that that guy designed. 
And so they're very close together. And really, this was the edge of the city at the time. It really set a trajectory of how um, the rest of the region grew. So this is what they sort of look like in plan. Uh, very much this idea of keeping the green belts and them being self, uh, self contained. And this is a, an advertisement for one of the neighborhoods. They're talking about modern schools and fine factories and attractive streets and like all these wonderful things. And what's hard to get our, our head around, especially with all the baggage of these, these modern buildings, is that these buildings were incredibly attractive. They were incredibly cool. There were people who wanted to live. This is an advertisement for one of them, a gentleman who's playing piano. This is um, the first time you had panoramic views of the city and underground parking and indoor pools and saunas and tennis courts. I mean, these, if you look at the condo boom today in many cities, this was the 60s version of it was the same demographics. It was marketed towards um, uh, you know, empty nesters or young professionals. This is another sort of set of advertisements for these buildings. There's like really dated gender roles here. It was sort of an idea of, of you know, modern um, uh, Mad Men, Jetson sort of style living. Uh, and, that, and these new neighborhoods that I was describing had just been planned. They also had, um, this was the Four Seasons that was built as this major resort center. This is the Ontario uh, Museum of Technology, which was built as this major investment. So these were sort of the center of where the city was going. And so that these, these were, you know, at the time, they were like, you know, the things that were being um, published and celebrated. This is uh, not in these neighborhoods, but elsewhere, but it really should speak to the heroism of this. These buildings are standing. Unfortunately, today they're much more shape, but these very aspirational sort of Jetsons type things, and the idea that um, it's, it's sort of, this is a very sort of Canadian context issue, so bear with me, but Canada was still very much a colony pre-World War II. We were relatively associated with what was happening in England. And so there's a real break in terms of uh, uh, the, the sense of nationhood that happened after the Second World War. And so part of this is a sort of shedding the fussy Victorians and saying, we're this, uh, an independent nation and we have um, a sense of independent confidence. So this sort of embrace of modernism is, is really sort of also associated with sort of Canadian identity in a certain sense, especially at this time. And that's where these are coming from. Um, and, and then what ends up happening is that these seminal projects sort of got enveloped just into the normal planning regime. And so this is, uh, this is a plan by the planning authority that talks about where high density should go in the Greenfield neighborhood. So the red is high density. And they basically said, oh, developers, you can build this to this model, but you, so you have to meet our density requirements. And so the reason that they wanted high density was a total technocratic issue. It was sewage capacity, school capacity, road capacity, transfer capacity. And the sewer systems were calibrated for the number of units that they were anticipating. And it was all just based on their tax work. They want this many people in this quadrant, and that, that's this tax base, and there you go. And the, the difference, the only major difference that I can, can see between the way that American suburbs were planned and Canadians is that we included these high density houses in these suburban neighborhoods and that there was a market for them. And so they were privately developed, they were publicly mandated, but due to a, uh, to a public demand or a kind of demand to actually live in them, and a robust housing industry was able to deliver them. So this, these sort of strange three factors uh, created these, these, these neighborhoods. And this is all based on the neighboring unit in a very similar way that most American suburbs were developed. Um, and if you look at some of the, the bullet points from these planning studies, they talk about a minimum density of 75 people per hectare, sorry, I don't know what that's in acres. Um, uh, so a minimum density, which is actually a fairly high density. But also they talk about the idea that they want there to be, uh, this to be a self-sufficient area and have enough mixed use to be able to function as a substantial part of metropolitan trial. So the idea is that these things were built as complete satellite neighborhoods that had a very large diversity of uses. Of course, I'll, I'll design at the scale, the scale of the car, um, but uh, mixed use at a high level. And this is a model for that particular neighborhood. So you have the low rise next to the new high rise. Uh, this is it under construction. It's sort of um, lovingly called the peanut because of the shape of the ring road. Um, this is called the peanut plaza. So this is when it was developed. And you can see that the high rise, mid rise, and low rise are all developed at the same time. They're all planned sort of uh, uh, with their continuity. And this is what it looks like sort of built out. So you have your regional shopping center, your spine uh, of arterials with high rises, and your low rises behind it. And this is a sort of how the formula works. And even though much more of the field here is low-rise housing, they represented less than half of the total needs. Um, and we had a German exchange student come in into our office, and he says, oh, you have a peanut in Frankfurt, we have a hazelnuts. And so this is the hazelnuts in Frankfurt. This is called uh, Northwest Stadt. This is near Romerstadt, which is a very famous modern neighborhood. And very similar typologies are happening here. You have the ring road, you have a shopping center, you have the low-rise and the high-rise. Um, and so there's, this is part of this idea that there's something interesting about the Toronto suburbs that they relate to the morphologies that are American but also European. There's something, some fusion happening. So this is uh, Northwest Stadt and this is the, the peanut neighborhood. 
And then this sort of repeated itself. So those are the three neighborhoods that we looked at. This is where the peanuts located. And then all the planning um, uh, districts, as they were called, as these were developed, followed the same model. So we have this idea of a ring road with high rises in the center and the surroundings. So you can sort of see that repeated all over the city. Uh, became just a model. This is sort of what that looked like when it was built out. I showed this to some European colleagues, and they thought it looked like the Soviet Union. So it's sort of interesting that this type of uh, landscape was, was developed. And they're very much sort of associated with these large arterial roads. And then the back end, we have a really extensive ravine system in Toronto. So there's this sort of landscape urbanism and this very kind of ecological sort of edge to them, which is amazing. Um, and then this is a swath of the city to the west. And it just sort of shows that, that just continuous pattern of low rise, mid rise, high rise. So the blue is mid rise, the red is high rise. And it's sort of the same amount sort of sprinkled sort of all over the place. And so downtown is about here. Um, this is what's uh, the mention that Greenbelt at the beginning of the top of Mount Falls in Toronto. They actually stuck to it. Uh, now this is suburbs as far as the eye can see, but it's about 1975 or so. That's, that's what it looked like. You really built high density at the edge and nothing beyond. Uh, and as a result of that, this is where, you know, where the, the weird stats came in. So, sort of, this is very counter to most people's uh, impressions in, in the city. Um, there's this real sort of Jane Jacobs idea that we're this sort of Victorian low rise city. Um, but in terms of high rises, this is 12 stories and above. So they're very small high rises, but that's, uh, there's a German company called Emporis that tracks this stuff, and this is where these stats are. So Toronto has a significant number of these um, uh, in the North American context, but Canadian cities just sort of seem to overall, just because they all, to a lesser extent, have this sort of same form uh, of high rises. I don't believe these numbers at all, the Chinese numbers are totally wrong, probably five times that number. Um, and then this is where you guys can totally contradict me and tell me I'm wrong. I threw this together pretty quickly. Uh, these aren't to scale. But this just shows some of the, the differences between Toronto and Chicago. So the red is where high-rise apartment housing is located, mostly along with Michigan. And in Toronto, it's just sort of speckled all over the place. And so the big difference here is that uh, if you go 20 kilometers or, or 15 miles inland, you're in sort of very, my understanding is fairly low density um, suburban form. Or if you do the same in Toronto, then you're in one of these sort of higher density hotspots. And so why this, this is noteworthy is that Toronto and Chicago are often compared as very similar cities. There's these great cities by great lakes um, and this type of thing. So it's sort of it's interesting in terms of what are then the emerging opportunities um, that we can take from this. But growing liability. So we all know these buildings generally all over the world are facing challenges. There's, there's no difference in Toronto. We have the same set of challenges. Um, the building form that was built. Uh, really hasn't changed in the last uh, 50 years. They've been kind of frozen in time, and these sort of um, period pieces in a way. And I can imagine the rendering of this when they, when they built it with people like having pigments and falling in love and stuff in here, but you know, it's very different than the beginning of day. The main thing, and the main um, uh, thing to consider is that while they've almost stagnated physically, they've completely changed demographically. So there's been an amazing influx of, of international migration into, into North America, into Canada, into Toronto, most of the, the arrival uh, newcomers, this is their first home. This is, this is sort of functioning now as the arrival cities of Toronto. And what's remarkable is that this is the biggest demographic change in, in our history prior to the Europeans arriving, um, and yet there's no physical evidence of this. It's almost as though it didn't happen, except for unless you go to the same street. So there's a very strange contradiction between a frozen built form and an incredibly, an incredibly dynamic um, uh, change in demographics. <laughs> and so part of this is part of some of the research we've done, and so then advocacy is looking at, well, how, how can this possibly be? And one of the issues is, and it's sort of an unintended consequence, is that the zoning, the sort of shrink wrap zoning that sort of happened in these neighborhoods, it really was sort of uh, what was built was then described in a bylaw. And you can see the site plan here. There's the tennis court, and there's the, uh, you know, it's almost like a resort. You know, the idea was these were mixed use at a high level, they were five minute drive to convenience, but of course no one's walking. And so that was sort of just instituted into the zoning bylaws. And what that uh, means is that while the city advocates for mixed use and all new um, neighborhood planning and all new developments and all the things that even talks about mixed use, uh, on the ground in terms of the zoning bylaw, the only thing that you're allowed to do in these areas is, is to do it well. You can't even have a small shop. Um, so as, as a result of that and sort of very um, particular legal teams that advise the landlords of these buildings, nothing has been able to happen to in these spaces. And sort of more than that, they were sort of designed as these very considered modern landscapes. And then as property has been fragmented and the kids of one you know, landlord inherits them and sells them to someone else, then these chain link fences that sort of emerge and the fragmentation of these landscapes into these sort of cordon fenced off areas. Um, 
and another issue is that because most of these are privately owned uh, and privately managed, they don't have the, the tools and simply were never never built or considered to deal with the emerging issues of the survival city. So things like childcare, settlement services, food shops within walking distance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These types of things just simply aren't in the mandates of these private owners. Um, and then sort of the overall, the way that the region has changed, I know this, the same is true in, in most American cities, is that Toronto was a great sort of middle class, middle income city sort of spread throughout in the 1970s and 80s. And now there's this real heightened concentration of wealth, um, increasing wealth uh, in the downtown core and along infrastructure. And then the darker shades of gray are areas that sort of emerge in increasing poverty. And so there's this sort of uh, impoverished suburbs surrounding a great wealthy center that's emerged in the last uh, uh, 20 years. If you zoom down a little bit, there's sort of like a wealthy or, or middle class sort of new edge suburbs, but sort of these inner suburbs are uh, where poverty exists in the city. Um, and so you get these sort of areas in these landscapes uh, where the driving rates are less than 35%. Most people take the bus or walk. Um, and so you have thousands of people living in these areas, and often you can't tell because there's nothing sort of happening in the public space or the public space. Uh, neighborhoods like this were you know, very well attended and how they were planned. Um, but again, without a car, if you live up here and you want to get your groceries, you're taking two buses or you're walking about three or four, or uh, maybe two or, two or three miles, and that's really tough. And in all cases, let alone uh, with kids in January. And so one of the big issues is, well, in this neighborhood, there's 19 towers and 13,000 people. Uh, that's about the size of a city if it was outside, um, you know, outside the major whole area. It would have its own uh, mayor and shops and theater and high street and the whole thing. And then I won't get into this in this lecture, but there's another issue with these buildings is that because they were built prior to the conservation movement, they're total energy gains. And they, they use more energy per square meter than a single family home. And so there's a whole sort of trajectory with this is looking at sort of carbon issues and sustainability issues. Um, an interesting little pop up there. So then, so it sounds all doom and gloom. So then we go back to looking, okay, what is the, the opportunity here? So we go back to the buildings and how do we, at the end of their first life cycle, how do we set a situation for them to enter their second life cycle through investment? We have these fantastic new arrival communities. How do we provide the opportunities and um, the ability for them to have agency and local economies within these, these spaces that are uh, these sort of frozen modern landscapes? Um, oh, sorry, this it must not have a font. I think this says, um, emerging opportunities or something very inspiring like that. Um, so a lot of this has been field work that I've done and colleagues have done to say, okay, this, this, this very complicated challenge exists. Um, where do we look for solutions? And so there's very few places in North America that we can go for comparable situations as urbanized high rise. Um, and so a lot of the field work has been in, in, in the European Union and to a lesser extent Russia and some small parts of China and Australia, but most of it's been um, so, I, so I visited most of these places, or all these places, and some more, with the, with the clear ambition of let's go to a comparable neighborhood and see if it's succeeding or failing, or what the local um, uh, strategy is. And it was sort of, a lot of this sort of happened after the 19, or 2006 Paris riots, and sort of that whole dialogue. Um, and I'm very pleased and sort of surprised to find that most countries have a very explicit agenda and a plan to do it. That some of them are more successful than others, some of them are um, uh, further on their way, and the East is much more kind of things have happened because of widespread sort of libertarianism, just sort of suddenly you can do all sorts of things. These neighborhoods are almost like carnivals happening on the ground floor. Um, and other ones are very concerted efforts of, of top-down planning, mostly in Western Europe. But we're gonna look at, look at some of these and what those opportunities are. This is, uh, this is one of my favorite comparisons. This is Toronto and this is Moscow. So when I arrived in Moscow, I was like, hey, I know this. This is, um, this is uh, a bit of the idea that these buildings went through this period of just uh, total rejection, total, um, through all the sort of planning professionals, this idea that they became enemy number one for a long period of time. And one of the people responsible for that is our friend Jan Gale, who we all love as the, the bike guy. Uh, but this is his first book. This is like Between Buildings. And I was uh, sort of pleased to see uh, that in his research in Denmark, he shows this ter terrible tower block in Denmark, this terrible tower block in East Berlin, and this terrible tower block in Scarborough, Ontario, which is a suburb of Toronto. So even, even in the 70s, we were famous for our terrible uh, suburban high rises. Um, and then, of course, this is a regime that happened for Margaret Thatcher. This is in France and you know, all over the place, too, to neighborhoods in Chicago, which is coming down. Um, and so this is the starting point for often discussion about these buildings. And so how do we combat that? This is the Trellick Tower. Uh, I'm not sure if you know it. This is a pretty famous building in London. It's in Kensington. Uh, it was built you know, as part of a very aspirational welfare state in the 60s by uh, a pretty interesting architect named uh, Hermel Goldfinger. And then it sort of showed up in a copper orange and all these dystopias. And it was like, the idea of the scary modern building. 
and then sort of now it shows up in designer dish plates, and the building actually has a has a waiting list and it's one of the popular addresses in the And so this idea that um, uh, these things go through fashion cycles, buildings go through fashion cycles, the idea of uh, uh, it certainly is a solution to wait until all these buildings gentrify, but the idea that they functionally don't work because of their any structures is incorrect. It's like buildings are just buildings, it's the system around buildings which, uh, which we uh, need to be paying attention to. So this sort of notion of fashion versus resiliency, and how do we build for resiliency? And the way that I'm defining it here is it's performance and adaptability. And so the failure that we've seen in Toronto with these buildings is a, a clear lack of these, building, the, of these buildings to adapt, and a stewardship is sort of um, uh, keeping them going following all the aspirational plan. This is a, a study we did for Toronto Public Health that examined these neighborhoods sort of through this, these lens. And so this is a very uh, urban lens, so I was very happy to participate in this. So looking at housing, transportation, food security, et cetera. And what we found is that these buildings perform poorly in, in all of these categories. It's just, okay, they're, they're underperforming. Um, but what I'm about to show you in sort of the field work is that they actually have an ability to uh, drastically improve performance by very little interventions in a way that um, single family home or other typology neighborhoods uh, cannot. So if you're a different typology, um, uh, let's say more, more low rise with very little open space, and you have the same set of challenges, it's, it takes a far more radical solution to be able to, to rework these. But by, by, simple, by simple measures, we're able to um, see some, some really interesting improvements. And so this is an example. This is from some of the field work. This is in East Berlin. And so what you're seeing here is former Eastern Bloc Towers that have been completely retrofitted to be like high performing low energy buildings, given like a new lease on life. And that's, that's one set of issues. But the other set of issues is what you're seeing in the foreground, which is this idea of the kind of neighborhood bustle and local economy that's associated with, say, a Victorian form or something like that. Um, it's very much alive and well uh, sort of in this context. And so a lot of the work that we've done is looking at how can these modern landscapes evolve to the types of expectations that we have about how our neighborhoods perform, and to really sort of challenge the myth that it's the form of the neighborhood itself. Um, and the reason that it's an imperative for us to challenge that myth is that, as I mentioned, this is housing for a million people in Toronto. We can't just have an aesthetic bias and say, well, we don't like this housing form, so we're just going to not fix it up. Uh, or we're going to tear it down. The, the other, there's some social housing in Toronto that's coming down as we speak and being redeveloped. And that's, um, I, from my uh, knowledge, mo most of the experience, uh, let's say in Chicago or other cities, where it's this sort of transformation of uh, public housing. Because the vast majority of these are uh, private housing in Toronto and they're economic private housing, there's no, um, there's no interest in the owners to tear them down. Right? They're, they're, they have utility to them. So it's about how do we work with them to, to improve the neighborhoods. This is another example of, uh, in Berlin again, just putting a coffee shop on the ground floor, a couple of umbrellas makes a, uh, a large difference. This is a more robust sort of um, an approach. This is in London. There's about five of these tower blocks uh, near, uh, at the time it was new, the Jubilee Tube Station. Uh, it allowed for uh, new condominiums to be built that cost subsidized, new community facilities, and the retrofit of the towers and the public spaces. So it's sort of like how do you have a public private sort of uh, arrangement to bring capital to these neighborhoods? Uh, this is sort of the eco retrofit stuff. This is again in Germany, um, and also building it and doing some of the streetscape improvement stuff. I don't think it's great, great architecture necessarily, which shows the flexibility of, of this typology. Uh, this is in Bratislava, so when I visited here, it was pretty interesting. Um, their entire um, the city of Bratislava, their entire <coughs> strategy in the EU energy was uh, energy reductions in these buildings and to turn them into low energy buildings. They're pretty cheap means, it's sort of uh, insulation and in stucco, um, but you're able to reduce the energy load by about uh, 80%. This is in Sweden, this is called the Solar House, as well as we are closing balconies, um, providing more uh, housing amenity, filling in the ground floor. This is pretty neat, they filled in the ground floor, turned into a winter garden, and that's where the, the laundry facilities are. So making it a low energy building, but also sort of ways of improving uh, tenant amenity. This is in Manchester. This is a little bit of a weird one, but just showing how, how radical these things can be. There's also this issue, this emergent issue of modern heritage. These are two uh, listed buildings in, in the UK. This is Golden Lane, which is about to be refurbished. This is Park Hill, which is underway. I recently visited there. It's a very, very interesting project. But how do you take a great deal of care to restore these things while well, giving them sort of modern or contemporary utility? Uh, this is in Amsterdam, this is the, the building here, um, and sort of like the community components and how the retrofit of these can be community-led and community-inspired. Um, and so I love these Dutch models, so it's to say, well, you've got these, you've got these buildings, and you've got landscape, but why don't you put bike paths, why don't you put mixed excuse on the ground floor? You can really change the way these, these neighborhoods are used. Um, putting social and community services right where they're needed, 
Um, in Toronto, and I'm sure in Chicago as well, there's a great set of public libraries and community centers and language training centers and all these things. They just tend to be in the wrong places. They're not where they're actually needed. And so this is an example of putting this right, right where the need is uh, to be catalyst transforming. There's also the issue of new housing. So this is in the UK, uh, new sort of family-related flats at the bottom of where a tower block is. Um, and as an architect, this is what I'm very, very interested in. What are the you know, opportunities for sort of growth in using this sort of modern framework for, for change? This is uh, also in London. This is pretty aggressive, but they put a heck of a lot of new housing at the base, putting streets and some sort of new urban stuff at the base. But this was um, uh, pub this public housing that was given to a housing association, so it's sort of a, a private interest. Um, so this is a mix of private housing and affordable housing, but it created enough revenue to retrofit these three towers and sort of one more has been completed so far. So this is a, an example of that. Uh, what the, the lobbies can look like. This is in Germany, these low low energy appliances and triple glazed windows and they have these little like little smart readers that tell you in real time how much energy you're using and all these things. So pretty pretty interesting from that perspective. But what I'm most interested in, and I'm sure what's interesting to you guys, is the sort of the community aspect of it. So these are some projects from this is in Rotterdam actually, these are from Toronto. And it's putting a community kitchen at the base of a building like this and providing some of the social infrastructure that suddenly thousands of people living above uh, can use that sort of latent um, cultural capacity and being able to, to use their neighborhoods in new ways. And so this is this is what's beginning to emerge and it's a huge uh, opportunity here. How do you bring food to these neighborhoods? How do you bring markets? How do you uh, better design public spaces to take advantage of the populations already there or their new future populations? And of course the tower in the park can actually be really fantastic and beautiful thing is just design property. So this is Ballonby, that neighborhood I showed you from the 50s. So this is what it looks like today. There's some new buildings that have been added. It's actually a heritage site, so there's really careful restoration of things. But it really is this idea of tower block mixed use transit from the space. It works very, very well. This is sort of that park um, example of London. And this is sort of a typical example of Toronto. So we have, a, we have a long way to go. This is an abandoned pool and all these sort of, these sort of sad landscapes. Um, but it's an enormous amount of density uh, with uh, an adjacent to fairly underutilized open space. Um, and the biggest challenges, and this the, the initiatives that we're getting off the ground now relating to you know, food and, and those types of things, uh, are technically illegal or at least non-conforming because of these old uh, bylaws. Um, this is the sort of template or the, the outcome of that study we did for public health where it came up with 36 measures that could actually help um, these, these different categories such as food security, community health, etc. And we found that the vast majority of these were per, um, prohibited by current zoning bylaws or current official planning policies. So it's like, okay, we all know we need to do this stuff, but this is why you can't do it. This is the paperwork that's in your way. And so this is, was a real call to arms to say we need to uh, begin to change things. And this is why. This is a diabetes map in the city of Toronto. The darker the red, the higher the incidence of diabetes. This is just one metric that public health has done this for all sorts of different indicators. Uh, so if you live in a tower block neighborhood, away from the core and away from transit, your health outcomes will be poorer. And a lot of that is because of poor access to local fresh food, poor access to um, those things that those policies we saw are preventing. Uh, so this was some really important research that we did that helped uh, move things along and create a pretty vibrant dialogue. Uh, these are some other pieces of research that, that we've done. Also, uh, you know, symposia, working with the university, and really sort of getting this sort of set of things out there. Because I mentioned a lot of this idea of uh, Toronto being defined by these thousands of uh, suburban uh, high rises is just not part of the everyday discussion. It's not how people tend to think of the city. Um, and we've been fairly successful. We've, we've established a tower in office at the city of Toronto. Its job is to coordinate all um, uh, departments and make sure that their mandates are taking advantage or include opportunities in these tower neighborhoods. Um, we've done a lot of consultations and worked with community agencies and you know, people on the ground to really get a sense of what are the real opportunities. I mean, as experts and as uh, academics, you can say this is what the data is showing us, but really, what is, what is the ambition of these real places? Um, and bringing that together, our sort of most recent victory uh, is we established a new zoning uh, framework for the, for the city and for these neighborhoods. And this took about two years because of how much paperwork is involved in something like this. Uh, but the idea is that these neighborhoods that formerly uh, were uh, mixed use from a thousand feet, but single use up close, how do we bring um, um, localized mixed use to these places? It's sort of what we describe as, as harmonizing um, policies. If you build a new condominium in Toronto, you can't build it unless you have mixed use on the ground floor and you couldn't hide it in these older buildings. And so what this new zoning category allows is that you can do all of these things uh, and you can have a very sort of wide amount of, of uses. And this is all the sites. This first round was about 500 sites and this was approved. Uh, it's gone it's gone through the final approval process of council and it comes into effect, I think, in September. So that's uh, where we are there. 
and we're quite hopeful of some of the uh, results. And then we're mobilizing and working with a lot of um, uh, community groups to do neighborhood visioning. When I say we, it's like lots and lots of people, many of them, um, who do this full time for a living. Um, and what's great is when working with uh, closely, especially the youth of the neighborhood, this is a project that's gone on for a few years, what they're telling us is it's, it's very, um, uh, overlaps very nicely with what let's say those other studies and what the other data tells us. You know, things like children's playgrounds, gathering spaces, convenient food and shops, um, gardens, community programs, connections, and to this we had places for entrepreneurs and social enterprises to actually engage in things. Um, so extensive neighborhoods for the visioning process, and then being able to tie that in with the United Way and other sort of third sector leaders to say how can they funnel some of their money and some of their um, logistical support to make these things happen. And so United Way has established a whole division and has a staff and, and resource to be able to um, put these neighborhoods at the center of a lot of their work. Ten years ago, almost all United Way uh, funding, there was $127 million um, that their funding went to downtown um, homeless shelters and, and soup kitchens and that type of thing. Now, um, I think 60% of their funding and their programs is now in the suburban area. So there's been a total shift in the mandate, and it's pretty, pretty spectacular. Part of that is actually building big community hubs uh, with a lot of infrastructure. And then, so the, after the zoning kind of went through, the consultation sort of got scaled up. So this is a neighborhood a counselor talking to a lot of people, people going to uh, tables to volunteer for different initiatives, um, getting sort of pilot projects up of community markets and gardens in these places. Uh, this is sort of a host of some of the ones that have happened over the last year or so. This is my favorite, so an organization called Food Share um, and Toronto Public Health took a few buses and converted them into mobile markets so they can drive up to one of these buildings, you know, pitch a tent, sell your, sell your fruit, and then drive off. The idea would be how could you really scale that up and make those things permanent. Um, a lot of this has been really community led in terms of people actually building and designing and um, these, these new structures, this is sort of a market to pavilion structure in one of the neighborhoods. This is a, probably one of my favorites. This is a, a Thorncliffe Park neighborhood I showed you at the beginning, the one with all those fancy advertisements. Now it's uh, Canada's largest Islamic community. Most people from Afghanistan and other places recently were torn. Uh, they've established a, um, a tandoori oven in the sort of night market uh, near one of the mosques. And so if you go there on Friday, the park is just filled with kids and people. And it's really, really fantastic. And so that's uh, really taking advantage of what this, um, these new bylaws will allow, but also just the community capital is huge, and how do you take, take advantage of that? Um, and this is a new community center that's being planned right at the base of one of these towers, um, which, which has really helped a lot by the new sort of zoning framework. But the next phase of this, and what my work is currently engaged in, is looking at some of the economics and the challenges about how do you um, look at these, these places as centers for, for growth, and how can that growth help cross subsidize some of the real things we need to invest in, like the millions of dollars required to fix up the buildings and, and pieces. So there's been quite a lot of studies done. Uh, definitely these places have the room to uh, absorb growth and how to do that in an appropriate way. And so some of the, um, if you took a neighborhood like this, there's sort of the small, um, <coughs> smaller pieces that we've seen in or what are sort of underway now, and how do you then shoehorn in through these other um, amenities and other types sort of into this? And what does that look like architecturally? Um, and in some neighborhoods where this is actually beginning to happen, you get enormous densities when people you know, come from the buildings, come from the new buildings, and um, you can actually have these almost like these mini urban conditions, which is pretty exciting. So with that, we're working with the city to say, what is their stream of, of resources? That the, what's the public offering? How can they improve transit, improve public spaces, improve um, community services, and that type of thing? Um, working with the, the private owners who own these buildings in terms of where they are and the real challenges around the realities and who's responsible for what, what happens if someone comes on your property and twists their ankle. This is the sort of meat and potatoes of how this can all be unlocked, which is underway right now. But sort of looking at those opportunities from a, a, a neighborhood perspective, sort of a district perspective, and then a metropolitan perspective. And so this is, um, this, this is sort of how we describe uh, tower renewal and, and the future potential of these, these um, inherited modern suburbs. And of course, this is why we're doing it, because the, the amount of um, community innovation and community potential. I mean, the way that we look at it is people have come halfway around the world, but these pre-selected risk takers who come halfway around the world to come to Toronto, they end up living in this underserviced tower block in the middle of nowhere with no services and they're told they can't start a business. It's like, you know, welcome. And so it's a real imperative to say we need to make this uh, successful arrival cities, but also successful for the future of the city. <coughs> um, and that's my spiel, so thank you very much.
the presentation. Um, and I'm doing work sort of on sort of the, you know, it's not a, the equivalent because I'm not looking at sort of suburban um, high rises, but looking at office towers downtown and um, sort of showing how the, there's a movement of tenants away from these modernist buildings that, you know, at the time they were built in the 60s and then again in the boom of the 80s were very um, desirable and the aesthetic was very appealing to people, but it's now exactly these kind of, you know, recent history types of towers that are the most sort of hard hit when there's another boom that puts all this new stock on the market that we did in the 2000s and all the tenants from these buildings moved. Um, so I'm very interested in sort of the issues, issues of cannibalization um, and wondering that perhaps you haven't faced as much of that in Canada because there, there's more restrictions on new construction than there are in the United States where we just we build to excess every you know, 12 years and then, we, then people move from, you know, then there's more mobility so people move from the older buildings to the newer buildings and it strikes me that you know, in order to create, create a market and to create sort of demand for these um, modernist towers, and you don't just need madmen and, you know, kind of like, you know, trying to kind of um, revive the aesthetic, um, you know, sort of try to, uh, in, you know, sort of make them more aesthetically popular today, but it's also about sort of potentially restricting other options for people to move to, and that, but that doesn't seem like where, where you're going, you're, you're looking for building opportunities on the sites now, is that because there's such demand for these Buildings, or, or you're just looking for a way to finance the renovations, or and, and how would you then prevent the kind of cannibalization that building new stock next to an old tower might? Yeah, no, um, I'm curious about interesting issue. So one of the context pieces is that the vacancy rate of these buildings is about two percent. So like, there's an incredible demand. So the, the demand is it's more the idea that these happen to be the affordable housing. They're the private. They're, they're the private sector affordable housing. Below that, we have uh, social housing. That's a totally a question. For, uh, just so you know, about 8% of the towers are social housing. The rest are private. Um, and so just the, the Toronto grows by about 120,000 people a year. Most of those are arrivals from overseas. And so these, these, the pressure on these houses, these, these buildings is incredible. Um, and so that's, so it's not an issue of demand. Um, it's, an, it's an issue of how do we incent private owners to improve quality. Um, and so part of it is done through incentive programs where if you retrofit, you get a discount. Um, there, the reason that we're now looking at the idea of um, how do we, so some of those English projects, how do we use the, the latent as uh, the asset and the land value to be able to then build these things and create capital to put into it, is that there, the big question is where does the capital come from to, to fix these up? And um, it, it raises a host of challenges. And there's an issue if you have a bunch of rich people living in condos and you put a big fence and there's poor people living in the tower block. Um, how do you set up planning policy that insists that you can only develop under the, um, uh, if you demonstrate you're going to put those uh, raised funds into your retrofits and how those agreements work? This is what we're in discussion with, but we had that little chat before we started. This is all in this very neoliberal context. This is the idea that the only way we're able to raise money to fix these older assets up is through more private development. And so um, we're being kind of pragmatic about this currently, and it's under the context of there's, there's massive growth pressures in Toronto right now. Um, I think there's 300 condominium towers under construction at present. So it's uh, it's this idea that there's such an a, amount of money being spent. How do we get some of that to go into this this issue? Um, also, there's it's very geographically specific where a lot of that new development is going. And so could some of that bleed over into these other neighborhoods? Um, and so th th these are all sort of the set of questions. Uh, every time I do this presentation, especially at different um, uh, universities at home, the issue of gentrification always comes up. It's like, what happens if one of these neighborhoods is, is gentrified? There's a few tools the city has. One is if you do a development agreement, because some of this has started to happen. Actually, I'll show you if you can bear with me an uh, example of what it looks like today. Just ignore all this, but just assume there might be questions about exercise. Here, here's one. So, this is the biggest one to, to date. So, the blue is a new development. Um, this is a suburban site, there's a subway station right here. The blue are new condos. The, these are the older towers, so these were built in the open spaces around there. And then the agreement was that the, these low buildings are affordable rental. These high buildings are very, very market, you know, super profitable Hong Kong developer thing. Um, and then also, 
the agreement was they had to build this new community center and maintain the rents of these older buildings at a certain degree level for 20 years. So there's, that's sort of the, 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 the kit of parts that the city has. Um, what we're looking at now is how do you go further than that? How do you then bring money actually into these buildings to deal with things like elevators, energy retrofits, quality of life? Um, and then the other piece is this was a rare site where the whole thing was owned by one developer. It was a lab, he's an Israeli developer. So it's like an Israeli, exactly right. It's an Israeli developer, but the, the people who buy the units are from Hong Kong. So that's what's happening in Toronto right now. Um, <laughs> um, and I'll just go to here. The biggest challenge we have, sorry, can you guys all seizures, um, is that most of the sites in Toronto are fragmented to the point where the ownership it might as well be as isolated tower. Every single tower is going to be zoned by different. Um, so that was a very long way to answer your question. That's clear. I mean, there's, I mean, you guys, Toronto's been growing as opposed to Chicago and Cook County, where we've been losing population. I think and that's part of the concern is like adding new stock in a, mar in a market where, you know, that kind of a trend line is very different than when you've got 2% of the And we have, a, we have a growth scenario currently. I mean, the, one of the issues too is that. Everyone says you know, the market's going to crash tomorrow. We've been seeing that for 25 years. But um, when the market does slow down, right now the only opportunity that we um, see that can bring real, let's say, up to you know, $10 million to the neighborhoods would be a development scheme. And in the absence of a viable development scheme, what do you do? And then it brings us to the issue of, well, should these be, uh, what type of you know, provincial or federal fund should be going into here right now at zero? Uh, what type of uh, responsibility should there be to actually maintain housing standards? Like, what is the role of the government in this? And um, uh, right now, the, the, a, the work that we're doing is there's a real uh, energy with government to say, how do we set up the conditions where private owners will reinvest themselves? And that's what we're looking at. Um, but there's almost zero interest, and I, I, I totally get the, the, the thinking. They're saying these are private buildings, they should look after their own buildings that we don't have to right? So, what are some of the political challenges uh, beyond just inertia and the status quo? Are there, you know, residents of the single family home neighborhoods who aren't thrilled about the idea of more density coming? Are there traffic concerns? Absolutely. So, where, what we've, we've done a big study recently, I don't have anything to show, <coughs> is we've actually done a market uh, heat map to say, let's let's look at one of these neighborhoods where we could do that kind of scheme of adding towers and cross subsidies. Um, we've shown that that can work financially, that developers can meet their profit expectations and there can be enough left over. Mostly because you're leaving the land asset as sort of in kind as a joint venture. Um, but the places where the market exists to support that are probably 10% of these sites. Most of these sites are in undesirable locations. It's just sort of at the fringe of where these things are. Um, actually, this, this might help. Um, so this is a, so this is the current, and I'll, I, uh, I'm embarrassed to say, not a very developed movement transit system in Toronto, the red are lines that are under construction currently, but this is under construction, that is, and these are hotly politically debated, they're funded, but they're, the form they take is, is very political, um, and then these are where the tower blocks are located. So in sites like this, there's massive amounts of infill around these uh, all these old tower blocks, it's happening until about 20 of the construction here. Um, but sites like this, or this, or this, or this, they're just off the map, they're just off the market map. So there, there's a scheme that will work in a certain scenario, like you can see, this is going to be very interesting when those uh, metro stations open. Um, but over here, that's never going to happen. So there needs to be a kind of concerted set of efforts to say, this is one way of dealing with the challenge, but what do you do in the case where it's the, the least opportunity? And that was part of the thinking about the, the zoning strategy to say, as long as we at least liberalize land use, then um, the third sector investment entrepreneurs, et cetera, can at least uh, deal with quality of life issues on the ground. Uh, but you're not going to be able to. Do it really challenging thing where you're going to get that level of investment. And in terms of answering your question, um, it's not anticipated that large developments would happen outside of these zones. So there's been sort of a series of um, neighborhood plans and consultation, et cetera, et cetera, about growth because of where these, these new rapid transit lines are going. Uh, but I think that you're right. One of the biggest political opponents are going to be you know, the people who bought this for the dream and don't, don't want to see change. Um, we, ha we have actually seen that there's been surprising uh, positive attitudes about making these places better. So the idea that the people who live next door generally have nothing to do with the people who live there and they're just, they're just sort of these quarantine areas. Uh, they're just two parallel worlds. And um, I think people would even say, in terms of their property values, it would be better if the building next door was fixed up. So there's sort of that side to it. 
Can you describe how people are taxed um, in terms of like uh, how much ownership there is and versus rental, and then also yeah. um, I might as well complete the question: um, cars, um, you know, is there investment in roads? Uh, people have cars. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, buildings we're looking at, so all the blobs are looking at here, and it doesn't include anything built since 1984. So that's that's what we're um, it's about 80% rental. There's a the condo I came in in the 70s and then some are condo, but most of them are rental. And the way it's taxed is that the, um, it's just sort of blended into their rents. Um, but the, one a political issue that's emerging is that uh, the tax rate for rental, because it's seen as an investment property, is three times what it is for homeowners. And so there's this issue of like harmonizing um, rates so that renters pay the same as homeowners. But then that means you have to increase the property tax of homeowners, which is political poison. And so there's this, this real issue. When we actually break it down, you say, I'm, I'm a new immigrant to Canada, I'm paying $1,000 a month to rent in a crappy neighborhood, but X amount of this is property taxes. And no one knows that because it's all the today. So we, these are some of the issues that are, that are coming up. There's also no mortgage in tax. Well, because there's, there's no mortgage interest deduction. There's less of a tax incentive to be an owner occupier. Uh, yeah, it's, it's true. I mean, um, overall, I think about fifty percent of the city rents and fifty percent owns. I think that's the way it is. What about what about car uh, cars? You know, like this <coughs> finance, how you people you know, own cars, they don't own cars. Just the irony of it is, these were all planned for cars. The parking rates in these neighborhoods are amazing. Like they're like one point three per unit. You know, mm -hmm. so most of these are going to find the right slot. Most of these, if you look here, uh, the surface parking lots are half empty, and the underground parking are certainly empty. So um, part of so the big demographic shift is that it's been replaced with people who don't own cars. Um, the suburban bus system is basically 100% used by people in these buildings. People here, though, they all have as many cars as you guys do. You know, it's like three cars per family kind of thing. Um, so there's uh, there's huge issues of traffic congestion, et cetera, et cetera. But what's, what's interesting is that without people intentionally planning it, inheriting these buildings, um, and, and, and the shift in demographic that's happened, meaning that we actually have this, this walking transit use, using population on the street. And so it's like, wow, does that then mean that rapid transit becomes more viable? And the new lines that I showed you, they're mostly suburban, uh, they're really targeting this, this user. Thanks for a very interesting presentation. I don't know very much about planning systems, but I in relation to the area that you look at, is that metropolitan Toronto? Is that just one municipality then? Or are there several that have to cooperate? And if so, <coughs> what are the issues this causes? And the other question is sort of related to this. The, the links with the rapid transit that you showed, how are they planned? Because if I look at this in terms of, you know, where's the majority of the population, you know, the tower blocks, would make sense to connect them, of course. Is it because they don't have a political lobby, or yeah, very good question. how does it work? So this is uh, the sort of greater region. It's about eight and a half million people. The city of Toronto is here, and that's about two and a half to okay. uh, And then this is this sort of what's called the greater Toronto area. Um, and so in here, there are these, it's really tough to see, but these subdivisions, they're called regions. I don't know why, that's what they're called. So this is um, York region, this is Durham region, this is Peel region, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's about five that make up um, this sort of greater Toronto area. What politically what line is the Green Belt mentioned? This is this is actually I don't have any mention of the Green Belt, but the Green Belt is essentially like here. Oh, okay. Um, and then these are sort of the outer municipalities, and it's, it's kind of like a different world out there. It's like more cities and about a couple hundred thousand in the right cities. So it's just this this is a provincially mandated planning area. Uh, it's about seven million in here, which is the greater Toronto area that kind of loops around. This is another part of city called um, when Metropolitan Toronto was formed, and I showed you that slide, which I think it's just here. Um, sorry, going the wrong way. Um, it worked very, very well. And so some of the things that I'm describing are, are being a bit of an apologist for it, because it got a bad rap. And kind of through the 80s and 90s, it was a very anti metro movement. Um, and the reason was it was actually able to say, here's our green belt, and then this is how we're going to be building these neighborhoods, and there's going to be some rational planning. What happened is as soon as they got to the top of the Green Belt, there was a big push in the 80s to put a new, we call it the big pipe, it was a new uh, 
water main from the lake and it allowed a massive civilization. Um, when that happened, and then over here, this city called Mississauga, but it started bleeding over, there was two choices. One was expand the boundaries of the metro, or to create other municipalities. And because this was a discussion in the 80s, of course it was about fragmentation and giving people a local, more local government. And so the, 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 the opportunity to expand the large planning authority was lost. And then there became a, a period of about 20 years of total sort of fragmentation. Now we're back uh, kind of full circle where there's this, um, let me go back to this map. So the, this, is a, this is a very strange term, so bear with me. This, this is sort of ostensibly known as the horseshoe because of the shape of Lake Ontario. And so they call this the golden horseshoe and started in the 50s because it's where the industry was. So it's a cheesy term, the golden horseshoe. So this is called the greater golden horseshoe. And so this is a, a planning area that the um, uh, province has created. And this is the outer part and this is the inner part. And the inner part um, has created a new regional transit authority called Metrolinx um, and a, a, a growth plan. And the growth plan is for this whole area. So they're trying to reinstate this idea of regional planning. So the regional transfer of the um, And so it's, it's very effective. But to your question, they have to negotiate with all these different agendas. And so people here say, no, no, we're not building that station there in the high city. Look, that's not where our community is about. Um, and then Toronto has its own set of issues. And Toronto's usually the bad guy in all these conversations. So there's, there's an imposition of a new regional authority that's sort of mimicking what happened in the 50s, but in a, in a sort of a clumsy way. Um, but I'd say the most effective thing has been the, the Greenbelt Act, though, that um, in circles here. And so it's, it's limited significantly the amounts of expansion. And all the municipalities have to how to develop plans that say that 50% uh, of growth will be within existing urban areas, and then 50% will be what they're allowed at the edge. And then that's planned to sort of fill up and sort of be done um, by 2030 or so. Changes you mentioned, do they apply to the entire? So that's just province? in the city. That's just in the city of Toronto. So the, the, <laughs> other, the other piece of this too is that we can only do this, you know, uh, local council by local okay. council. So Toronto's big. I mean, it's the majority of where these things are. It's 1,200 of these towers, um, and so our focus has been there. But we're also working with Hamilton. We're working with uh, the city of Brampton. Um, so there, there's lots of work to do. There was a question. For the second, um, like kind of Tower Boom on your timeline, the one happening in the 90s or to now, is that also kind of country in the suburbs, or is that more in urban core? Very urban. So, so with that, um, so that's this guy here, yeah, so this yeah. is what we're looking at. It's sort of, I think the first postcard image I showed you, where the heck is that? Um, sorry, guys. In my head, I wish it was popped up. So, here, so this, this is what it is. It's like all along the waterfront. It's, it's very concentrated downtown. It's also concentrated in, um, surprisingly, I think Bob saw this when he was visiting recently, um, some of the larger suburbs have their own downtowns, and they're usually around big sh regional shopping centers. And there's, I don't have a photo of it, but there's this, uh, one of those called Mississauga. It's a suburb, but it has uh, 800,000 people, and it has 50 story towers all around their big shopping center. So it's like there's these sort of like fake Las Vegas style downtowns that are popping up. Um, but what's really interesting about it, just seems like this is what it always interested me and confused me a little bit, is that it happened in the 50s and 60s, and it's happening now. There seems to be an insatiable market for people to live in high-rise buildings. It's just that people are completely comfortable with it. And um, when I travel the world and go to Holland and, you know, and talk to people, there's always this issue that, well, high-rise is clearly bad and no one wants to live there, so who's buying these things? And in the, in the Toronto context, which is really weird because the Toronto context is also all about um, the sort of Victoriana that I was showing you before. The, the identity of Toronto is so much embedded in this stuff, and yet people are uh, buying up to 30,000 pound units a year. So it's strange. You can explain to me. There's also no stigma though. Yeah, no stigma. What's brown sugar? Where is that? That second store. <laughs> Next to the hardware store. Oh, I don't know. I should go check it out. It's not near my house, so. <laughs> Yeah, and it's, it's interesting. I'm sure you guys followed uh, the mayor Bob Ford debacle that uh, we all enjoy. And um, what's interesting about that, if, I know we have to wrap up, but I'll just um, go back to that map. Um, one of the things that the city's been addressing and that we're really hoping this project does, this is that um, 
exhibition we did, and we were actually trying to profile all these different neighborhoods. And so we showed the density of a typical downtown neighborhood, the density of a really dense downtown neighborhood, uh, and then comparable neighborhoods in the suburb. So what's a low density suburb in terms of density, and what are some of these high, high rise ones? Uh, and then we showed uh, other neighborhoods around the world and showed, like, what does this look like? So you can give density a number, but it doesn't take anything about the form of quality of life. So we look at neighborhoods in Amsterdam, neighborhoods in New York, neighborhoods in small other communities, and sort of say that there's much more to planning than just density because the, all the planning authorities just say, meet this density, you're done. Um, but what is really interesting about this is that so much of the discussion and dialogue up until recently has been around a select number of neighborhoods sort of in the core. And so the discussions about the quality and future growth of these neighborhoods just really wasn't part of that, that dynamic. Um, this, is the, this is what this is the city of Toronto, it was the boundaries of metropolitan Toronto. So what happened in 2008 is again, a top-down thing from the province, they said, it would be way more efficient if you were just one city rather than a metropolitan government with eight cities within it. So we're just going to do that. And there was a local referendum who voted against it, but it didn't matter. It was a conservative government that said this is more efficient um, and, and pushed that through. So there was a huge identity crisis. So suddenly, all the downtown snobs and the neighborhoods that I live said, I don't want to be associated with Scarborough and North York and all these places. Um, and then the people here were saying, downtown gets everything, it's, it's our turn. So Mayor Rob Ford, he's the first mayor elected in the big city who represents the sort of marginalized suburban voter. Um, the first two mayors we had were downtown mayors who represented that thing. The mayor we have now is a downtown mayor who represents sort of that thing. But there's this real push to say um, there needs to be a, a vision for one city. And it's been this sort of hangover of that forced nomination saying, what is that? Um, this issue of tower renewal is one of the things that sort of clicked with people because even downtown these neighborhoods do exist. And so how do we do something that relates to every neighborhood and, and every, every part of the city? It's creating kind of new neighborhoods, a new narratives, a new sort of sense, sense of identities. But there's this real clumsiness because it is it's astounding to me, let alone to you guys, how could someone like that become having a political currency? And it's because his whole he was basically representing people who just felt left out of the discussion and were you know kind of in a, in a clumsy vandalism type of way. But uh, and thankfully that was <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that those are those are some of the issues we're dealing with, and it's another major reason we talked about this, those future transit lines. Some of them are really questionable locations. I mean, there was a previous transit plan that was about really connecting high density nodes and putting things together in a much more logical way. But suddenly, rapid transit in Scarborough is political issue number one because that's what the Scarborough voters want. They want to have the same rapid transit downtown nodes, and so there's this whole very complex um, dialogue as a result of this sort of forced. Well, um, I think we've got to wrap up with the class. And again, thanks. thanks for